The mower. The mower stored twice. Kneeling, I found a hedgehog jammed up against the blades, killed. I had seen it before and even fed it once. Now I had mauled its unobtrusive world unmendably. Burial was no help. Next morning I got up and it did not. The first day after a death, the new absence is always the same. We should be careful of each other. We should be kind while there is still time. Philip Larkin's poem, The Mower, that last sentiment, so simple and profound, is like the moral of a sermon or a fable. We should be kind. An imperative, an order even, one that seems to suggest that we often stray far from kindness and need reminding of it. How wide does the circle of our care stretch, we might ask. In this poem, Larkin implies that each other must include much more than just the world of our fellow humans. It must include the non-human world, the lives of hedgehogs and other beings that share our planet and our gardens. We should be careful of each other. We should be kind while there is still time. An acknowledgement of impermanence and the fragility of life. The Mower is a late poem in Larkin's output, written in June 1979. It is a true story based on real events. Larkin, then in his late 50s, is the mower in question, and the grass grew in the garden of his house in the Newland Park area of Hull. The machine itself is now in the archives of a university. This poem is more than a document of a small domestic incident, though. It's a parable, too. Forty years later, it takes on an eco-spiritual dimension. The humble hedgehog is, after all, a kind of poster species for mass extinction and biodiversity loss in the UK. Larkin opens with an image of the poet kneeling, which could be read as a symbol of piety or guilt or even submissiveness. The speaker indicts himself in this death. His tone is genuinely humble. There is remorse, graciousness and tenderness a valuing of interspecies life that feels wise, vulnerable and Buddhist-like. Mowing the lawn is a typically middle-class ritual, and there is a naivety too. While attending to one's own small plot of land, the speaker has become complicit in destruction elsewhere. The poem is a kind of sermon. This idea appeals to me, Religious texts are full of poetic imagery, and there is persuasive power in the image, even if it is only experienced in words. We need to see examples of how to live, of how to act, and of what to do with the things we encounter and how they make us feel. Poetry, religious or otherwise, can offer us this. We need good descriptions, says the British psychoanalyst Adam Phillips. We need to know something about the descriptions that have stuck. Descriptions of, to put it as simply as possible, people having what some people think of as a good effect on each other and of people having what some people think of as a bad effect. In 1954, my grandfather, J.K. Antrobus, minister, preacher and, privately, a poet, visited a church in London to give a sermon. My grandfather died the year I was born, so he exists to me in a box of sermons, unpublished poems and journals. In this particular sermon, a section that sticks with me is when he asks the congregation to take inspiration from the image of St. Paul's Cathedral standing solemnly among the smoke of 1940s Blitz London. That same year, Philip Larkin published one of his more famous poems about religion. It's called Church Going and opens with a very different scene to my grandfather in front of the congregation. In Larkin's poem, the speaker comes to the church alone when he's sure there's nothing going on. The church isn't at the heart of a moment of worship. 
but a history-laden emptiness to wander through with its tense, musty and unignorable silence. The speaker here is having both an in and out of body experience, going into the church alone and into himself. Superstition, like belief, must die, he goes on to say, a huge sweeping statement which is questioned as soon as it's proclaimed. And what remains when disbelief is gone, he asks. Larkin is exploring a paradox. Non-belief is still a form of belief. Is it possible to live without ever feeling the need to address spiritual, religious or moral questions? Something that impresses me, reading my grandfather's sermons, is that he would reference non-Christian beliefs and deities without pitting them against his own faith. That there were many religions and gods and goddesses in the world was to him proof that human beings, at a fundamental level, need to believe in something larger than themselves. Sometimes he would reference beliefs that contradict his own. In one sermon, he admits that he read Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian and found it interesting, and that Russell does make points that he agreed with. He was impressed with Russell's humanism and wartime pacifism. Yet, as he closes the sermon, he ends by neatly flattening the complexity to proclaim that Jesus is the light and the way. Of course, he had to. He had a congregation relying on him to deliver and model an unwavering faith, like St. Paul's looming over the blitz smoke. But I feel his religious belief confined him sometimes. The pediatrician and psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott said that play and uncertainty are among the things that constitute a good life while Adam Phillips muses that religious conversion can narrow our minds and over-organise our attention, placing us in a world of confirmation bias where everyone believes what we believe and no one challenges what we don't. I think Larkin, for most of his life, was someone who wanted to be sure, who longed to be secure in his atheism and cynicism. But experiences like the death of a hedgehog in his garden or the encounter with the ancient and the strange silence of the church he wandered into, these experiences and the poems that came from them represent something more unknowable and mysterious. We should be careful of each other. We should be kind while there is still time. The poet Andrew Motion talks of a Larkin he knew as being a quietly spoken, considerate man at the end of his life who discussed spiritual matters intimately in phone conversations. But letters also revealed some troubling things that Larkin said, wrote and did. His disdain for working class people, his complaints about the Black Panthers, his admiration for fascists like Enoch Powell, his casual misogyny and porn addiction. Maybe... A spirit of kindness informs this essay. Rather than ripping Larkin to pieces, which might be too easy, are there things to learn from a man capable of great harm and great poetry? I'm trying to be honest and kind, even if Larkin himself wouldn't extend his kindness to someone with my background. We should be careful of each other. We should be kind while there is still time. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Writing poetry has been a constant for me since I was around six years old. Maybe it's like mowing the lawn, a way of finding order or neatening out the mess of thoughts that grow in my mind. My practice of poetry is a kind of ritual, a humble submissiveness because I rarely know what I'm going to write when I show up to the page. I also rarely know where the impulse to spend hours toiling over a word, a line, an idea, a shape, a sound comes from. But I'm convinced at its most sincere, it is a holy practice. And at its least serious, it's fun. I shared this idea with my friend, the poet Hannah Lowe, and she laughed and said, Yeah, in English poetry, you're not meant to admit such things, but there is a therapeutic or spiritual quality to craft. I wasn't always able to think about my work and my life in these terms, 
to my 20 year old self, the idea of something being holy was laughable. In the past, I had labelled myself an atheist and been judgmental when meeting religious people, seeing their faith as an inability to cope with reality or as a kind of naivety. I only understood one's need for faith as a weakness or deficiency. In my 30s, I've distanced myself from such atheism. I began to feel put off by the dogmatic arrogance of many of its followers and advocates, and I didn't enjoy the conversations I had about faith with other atheists. It often seemed to be a belief system that relied too much on intellect and rationality, closing itself off not just from spirituality, but emotional vulnerability and the humbleness of uncertainty. We should be careful of each other. We should be kind while there's still time. In this line, I see my grandfather again, standing at the lectern in his congregational church on Alexander Road in Hemel Hempstead. He knows every name in his congregation and addresses them directly in his sermon. Miss Smith, who is having trouble with her noisy neighbours. Mr Lawrence, whose son has been ill and bedbound all week. Mr and Mrs King, who are celebrating their 10th wedding anniversary. Each of them are acknowledged alongside the Lord and the charged and serious biblical language of God-fearing wrath and worship becomes grounded within a church-going community. Sacred spaces become more and more interesting to me. When I lived in South Africa, I was welcomed into a mosque, its wide white walls that held the wailing calls to prayer, the shoes and sandals piled at the door, and the synchronised rows of kneeling men are images that stayed with me. During my years in America, I joined services at a Unitarian church in New Orleans. The brass band blared through the church, the Black Lives Matter and Trans Lives Matter flags hung loudly behind the preachers. And having recently moved back to England, I bumped into my old religious education teacher in the street who invited me to Quaker meetings, civic-like carpeted rooms full of chairs and silence. These spaces were like open questions, asking me to consider my purpose, my connection with the seen and unseen world. I think a poem, even a short one, can be a kind of entrance into these entities. Larkin's poem, The Mower, collapses the space between the religious and the secular. Larkin had wanted to be kind. He had fed the hedgehog that he accidentally killed, and yet he cannot undo his action. Rather than ignoring the incident, though, he writes a poem. He uses his gift in an act of service to honour, even immortalise the creature. Larkin shows us that he is open to moments of holiness. This is where I find my way into the poem. It honours so many ideas of faith and gives an act of kindness the complexity it deserves. It shows us that we can be alone or with company, in a garden or a sacred building, when transcendence, epiphany or just a simple moment of insight can inspire us. It suggests that a powerfully meaningful experience is potentially available to us all. The poet Raymond Antrobus with the opening essay in our series Larkham and Believing.